March 18, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Mr. George Hoffaber and Alma Lee Hoffaber Hartman, brother and sister. Okay. George is from Hoisington, Kansas. He's here visiting. Sir, when were you born? I was born March 14, 1906. And I was born October 19, 1908. Who's your father? Jacob G. Hoffer. Where was he from? Frank, Russia. F R A N K. And who's your mother? Maria K. Steinley. S T E I N L E. Where's she from? From Dreispitz, Russia. D R E I S P I T Z. They were the Germans brought in under Catherine the Great. They were Ger we're German, not Russians. Yeah. Where were you all born? I was born near Ellenwood, Kansas. And I was born in. in uh... Russell County, Kansas, it's a room. Well, it's up south and west, I believe, of Wilson, Kansas, but it's, uh, it's in Russell County, that's all. It's. How long did you live in Kansas? Well, my folks were married there in 1900. They did not know each other in the old country. They met in this country. And they were married in 1900 at Ellenwood, Kansas. And then my dad came to the Panhandle and bought the land in 1912. Then we moved here in 1916 from Central Kansas, from Ellenwood, Kansas, uh, to the farm that he had purchased in 1912. Did your folks ever say how come they left Russia? Yes, sir. My dad was getting ready to be mustered into the service, and he said that was not a country to fight for. He had one; he wanted nothing to do with it. So, uh, and uh, so he came to America with his married sister and her husband, and they had one child. What year? Uh, he came in in the early 1800s. I can't remember exactly which date. And mother and came with her family. She was the oldest in her family, and they wanted to get away, just break away from there. They had all of they could take. They'd been in there around 200 years. My forefathers. And the and the and the see the promises that Catherine the Great had made to them were just well Catherine was dead and the others that were rulers were just picking on to these German people they were just their slaves you might say and uh, things were just getting to where they didn't want to stay anymore and they heard of new homes in America and that's what they wanted to come so my granddad and his family of six or eight children came to near Dorrance, Kansas in August of 19, 1899. Yeah, was, I guess there's always a war going on in Europe at that time. <laughs> well, they, they, see, they, they gave them uh, immunity from being called into the service for, what, several hundred years? And those years were up, and they were calling these young men. Some of Dad's nephews, he was the next to the youngest of, of 13 children, so he had nephews about his own age and uh, or older. And they were already being called into the service. They were married and had children. And they eventually all broke away. And I know he sponsored one of his nephews over here. And, uh, uh, well, he sponsored several people to come to America. But he was an, a lad of 18 years old of age, and he left his mother and father, never saw them again, and went with his sister and, and her husband to America. And, uh, of course, he couldn't speak the language. That took a little bit of doing, so just pick up and go. So he worked on the section, and he would listen to the section hands as they ate their lunch to speak English. And a group of the Germans would get together and they'd visit. And he said, well, I know that language. I want to learn English. So he'd sit with the people who spoke English and he learned the English language. So he learned to speak it. And uh, although my parents never had any schooling in this country, they could read English. They listened to the news and they knew more. Mother had knew more about history than we did because when she came to this country, she got a German history book, which went from the beginning of the history of the United States to, I believe, Roosevelt was president. And she could tell us children more about the, about the history of the, of the United States than we learned in school. But uh, uh, they, uh, uh, Dad never wanted to have anything to do with Russia. In fact, when he died, he asked me not to put that word in his obituary, just say he was born in Europe. Because he just detested the country. 
Did he ever talk about the trip over here? Yes, uh, to some extent. I believe Mother, well, yeah, they, they would, they had like first and second class, you know, and the, the poor people were down in the hold. And uh, I can remember him telling that they didn't get as much heat as they did, things of that nature. And they were on the water, what, three weeks, maybe? You remember? Uh, quite a while. It took them quite a while. The boats weren't so fast. Several days. Uh, the land that my dad bought here was a, a relinquishing, well, not a relinquishing, it, was, it had been a homestead. And uh, the one quarter still had the dugout on it where the man had lived. And it has little windows that, where they entered, you know. And I still have one of those windows as a souvenir. And I'm going to take it to Goodwill one of these days to the museum and just give it to them. Uh, Mr. Holman had owned the, the, well, he owned the two quarters my dad bought, but the east quarter was the one where Mr. Holman had, had homesteaded on. Is that he bought from? He bought it from, uh, from August Holman. His son later was a banker here who was a, uh, who died, oh, about two or three years ago, and he was uh, in that bank 50 years, that son. In fact, his wife, his son's wife is here today. Uh, Elmer Holman was the banker. August Holman moved in just, just south of town, and he was a mail carrier, and he delivered the mail on a motorcycle. But, uh, oh, one more question. Did your parents come through Ellis Island? No. No, they came to, uh, to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, directly. And then by train from there to uh, my mother's people to Dorrance, Kansas, which is Russell County. And uh, Did they have sponsors over here then? Or did they just yes, come? somebody had to kind of sponsor us. Uh, kind of, they had to give somebody's name, you know. But I couldn't remember what names. But my dad uh, came to Lincoln, Nebraska. When he got to uh, was Chicago, the money was all gone. And uh, the, uh, he had to stay there a while until they could get to Lincoln and get somebody to send him back. And then he made the trip by himself from there to Lincoln. I believe it was Chicago. And that took a little something because you were in a strange country and couldn't speak the language, you know. But there was a German man at the, at the uh, depot when that train stopped, and he took him under his wing and took care of him and saw that he had a place to stay. He's, I guess he's used to say those German people stuck together a little bit. <laughs> We have an international organization now of the Germans from Russia uh, to keep our heritage alive. After all, we are Germans, not Russians. And they, uh, we are 13, I believe 13 or 14 years old. We have over 5,000 members. And they, they have, uh, uh, their headquarters are at Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's quite, quite an interesting organization. Can you, both of you, tell me the chores that you all did on the farm as a child? Yes, George, you want to talk a while? We had chores. I don't know what to talk about. Well, our chores. We herded cattle. <coughs> yeah. Uh, one thing <coughs> I would like to mention here about the place where we lived out there, about the water well that was on that place. And it was dug 60 foot. They go around the hole 60 foot down, and then it was drilled down the rest of the way. 60 more feet. And then it had the big old pipe on cast iron pipe, three inch pipe in that well. And that was, was on that well. And in later years then, those pipe uh, started to leak. And then of course we went back to the two, two inch pipe. And then when we made the storm cave out there, we took this dirt and dad filled this hole in there for fear it would cave in, you know, maybe we'd catch it falling. Where were the two he's afraid to fall in there? And I thought that might be kind of interesting. And that was some of the best water. You see, taking from the uh, Ugalala Aquifer, mm -hmm. that's where that water is from. The best water in the world out there on that farm. And there were three of those wells that I that I can recall. There was one uh, to half a mile west, and then where the what, what was called the Old Buffalo Post Office. Uh, post Office, no, the Old Buffalo. How, how far is that from Hooker? About seven miles out. You see the sign when did you come from Goodwill? Yeah. Well, you saw it. It's on the yeah, south yeah. side. It says Old Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. And the Old Buffalo School. I mean, the Buffalo School is still east of there. Go ahead. But anyway, there was one there. I know we used to herd cows over there at that old Buffalo there. And it was still open, and the yeah, folks would warn us to not fall in there. <laughs> and then it White was, White had one. There were four of those. Was it White had one? Yes, he I had one. Right, he had one of those well houses, you remember? The well houses were made of sandstone, taken quarried from the Pony Creek, which is about two miles south of our place. And that's what the old Buffalo Post Office was built of. They're sandstones or, you know, square stones. Uh, 
and each of these places where these wells were had, had one of these little milk houses that we call cream houses where the people kept, and there was trough in there where the water ran through where they kept their cream and butter and milk, you know. I can tell, so the landowner kept their milk and butter in the house. <laughs> Did other people keep theirs? In well, I don't know about that. At the, at, I don't know how that worked. I think just the man that lived, yeah. who was the postmaster and lived in that building. I have some pictures at home of that old post office and the interior of it. Uh, came about them later, you know. And uh, she had a lot of plants in there, that lady. I guess it didn't freeze because of the heavy, thick walls. And it had a little greenhouse in there. But they, uh, they had dances out there at that old Buffalo post office. And they would come from as far as 50 miles uh, on horseback. And they'd spend the weekend there. And they'd have dances and parties. Uh, maybe like many as 50 people would gather there. When is that post office built, Old Buffalo? I have, the, I have the dates at home. In the 1800s latter part, it was closed. Uh, they had, uh, you know, the big railroad bridge when you go to... All right, when that was, when the Rack Island came through at the turn of the century, uh, the uh, people that worked on that railroad, they were stationed, I'm sure, at the Buffalo Buffalo Post Office, and they had a tent city, you know, and then they dug down actually for sh water drainage on those tents, and during the dust storm years, that soil eroded and blew away that you could just see the imprints of where all the tents set out there. on the north. I think it was on the north side of the railroad track. And they were there, no doubt, for quite a while getting that railroad bridge built. You said you herded cattle. Both of us. Both, both of you. That was our job. Yeah. How many head of cattle did you have? I don't. We didn't really have too many, I suppose. Well, we herded the milk cows, see, for milking. Okay. There'd be seven to yeah. ten. Jerry and heard. maybe as much as 15 in the herd, the calves and all. How large of an area did you have to herd the cattle? Well, Dad had two quarters, and we'd be down the east part of that to herd. And then we went to this old, which would have been a, a mile from home, and then we herded along the road, the road section, you know, lines. section lines, you know. Bar ditches. And we had to be with them so they wouldn't get people's crops. Yeah. Well, at that time, too, when, when we moved on that place, uh, see, like she said, there was two quarters. But it wasn't all broke out. The maybe was... 10, 15, or 20 acre patch here that was in sod, and, and that's kind of where we herded those cattle. And then it was infested with prey dogs and rattlesnakes. And that's what oh, we had. We encountered a lot of rattlesnakes. I'm sure we had more than one guardian angel that we didn't get bitten. The dog got that bit, dog had gotten bitten twice. Good. He protected us. But we there were there just, just a lot of rattlesnakes out there. There were at that time. I guess there still are now. We were just about a mile and a half from to two miles from Pony Creek. And they, of course, they live there. Is that the creek, Pony Creek? Mm -hmm. That's Pony Creek. Uh, it doesn't only flows when you have a lot of rain, and then it's a mean little stream. It's high in the middle when it flows. It just rolls and boils. When you get rains out west, north of Guyman, Gulf Creek flows into Pony Creek. And you get that water from out west, and you really have a treacherous little stream while the water lasts. How wide is Pony Creek when it floods? Oh, probably as places as wide as this, but not everywhere. Uh, maybe half the width of this room. Then you have the Beaver River, which is really the Beaver Creek, you know, oh, too. And Pony Creek, by the way, not too far from where we live, flows into the Beaver River. How has Pony Creek and the Beaver River changed since you've been here? Quite a bit. They've changed the channels. I don't know about Pony Creek, but I know Beaver River has. Down there where the bridge is where I'm going by. Now, did that change by man or did it just naturally? Partly by man and partly by nature. Both. And when that Beaver River comes up, there's another wild stream. But that's what goes into this Optimal Lake now. And the Optimal Lake was the project that was wrangled around in the government the longest of any project in the United States. How come? Depression came along, and we're just the stepchildren out here. We always have to wait till the last. You know that, don't you? Or don't you know about us being oh, the stepchildren? Oh, yes. <laughs> and that is one of the reasons. And they could always get money for downstate for the lakes and dams, you know. But <coughs> not this optimal dam. And it was finally, when it, even when it was put through, and I went down when I, they turned the first shovel of dirt, you know. 
It still was, what, 10 or 15 years till they got it in? Well, wasn't there something about the war came along and they didn't have the funds to carry out? And yes, so and, and it was right during the Depression when they wanted to start it, like in 35, I believe, when they first... But I, and there's another thing. It was supposed to have been closer to Optima, on the other side of Optima, and then the engineer decided that this over here where it is now was a better place. And there was another thing. Uh, Hardesty did so want that lake called Hardesty Lake because it practically covers old Hardesty, the first old Hardesty. And uh, uh, then, then and leave the dam called Optima, you know. But somehow or another it went out. It's Optima Lake, Optima Dam. And I think that's what it should be because... Uh, it was first started down Bobtoma, where it would have the name originally. But um, I can see why Hardesty, because it's, it's nearer Hardesty than it is Optima. Who founded the town of Optima? That I couldn't tell you, but it's a it's a Latin word meaning the best. The best. It's a plural, plural of optimist. Who founded the town of Hooker? There's a little bit of controversy about that, but the story I have always heard is that there was a cowboy in this area that uh, um, uh, was named for the old general Hooker, and his name, nickname was Hooker. And we've been told that that is where they've got its name, to this cowboy. And I think that's a story we hear more often. Do you all have any memories of uh, World War One? We certainly do. Being German people, we really have the memories because well, we were the ones that were desecrated, you know. I was going to say, was there oh, any prejudice land. towards Oh, land, family? yes. A next door neighbor who was married from a man from Germany, married to a man from Germany, was one of the, could be one of the ugliest neighbors there was. And uh, uh, Mrs., uh, you know, Mrs. Fox. And uh, they were always, when we had our lunch in our lunch pail, they'd have seat on meatless days if we had any meat sandwiches, you know. They'd have to give the kids a peep, you know. Oh, yes. Uh, I must tell you a little story that might be of interest to you. At Optima, we still had German services in the Lutheran church, because we're Lutherans. And um, uh, the preacher was preaching German, and we had two guys live downtown that didn't want the people, see, they didn't want people to talk German. And the, and the, pulp, the pulpit was up high, or those old-fashioned pulpits, and he saw these two guys coming during the services. And when they entered the uh, narthex, he just switched over and preached English. And they went in, sat there about 10 or 15 minutes. They got and walked out. And when they walked out, he went back to his German preaching. So he wasn't quite so dumb. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing. And this one guy had a grocery store. And, and there were two grocery stores. And the one man in the one grocery store just, he didn't care if those people spoke German when they came in there. Some of those older people couldn't speak English too well. The other guy was dead against it. And he didn't have much trade for that reason. They all broke the clock over. Uh, I know, can you remember telling Mother, oh, Mother, we might be fighting the German people, but we're not fighting the language. Why couldn't we keep on speaking? Because I wanted to remember that language. And to this day, I have uh, a, a, a degree in German. I have spoken it all of my life. I don't know when I learned English or when I learned German. And uh, uh, I teach German, and I am in the, on the translating committee for our German from, German from Russian organization. And I'm always translating things for people. So the, uh, the language has been an asset to me, and I could never see why they were fighting the language. You know, Was fighting. there any prejudice against you two personally? Uh, not so much, but boy, they watched what you had in your lunches. <laughs> They, they, they look, well, we had meatless days. Yeah. And you weren't supposed to have any meat sandwiches. They always look to see if we had meat in our sandwiches, you know, stuff of that nature. We, uh, we never were, we were never were wanting for anything. Dad was a good provider. And uh, asking Mrs. Nash a while ago about the butchering days, he and I got in on a lot of that. I think we could right now butcher hog and he could cure the hams and we could, I could rent the lard and we could do everything. <laughs> How do you cure the hams? How do you cure a ham? <laughs> well, the way we done it, uh, we trim them, get the surplus fat off and kind of trim them around and get them shape. Uh, we had salt that uh, mixed with, uh, I believe it was brown sugar. It was a solution. It rubbed that good with, with the, this solution. And the salt had the smoke in it. Yeah, sometimes. And sometimes. Then you could buy it. Sometimes it would liquid smoke. Then we had a, a syringe with the needle out about that long. Yeah. And you'd make a liquid, and you'd fill that syringe, and then you'd go along the bottom of the hock, 
pull out that bone and, and push this liquid into the hand, inside. Around the bone. So it would cure out around the joint and all that. And then we'd uh, let them lay sometimes and then we'd put a little weight down on them. And after the salt and stuff had more or less dissolved, well, you'd probably rub it again. And it'd take, oh, sometimes a couple of weeks or more to, to cure one out. And then, of course, we'd put them in a mesh, uh, mesh bag. A bag of a... Uh, a mesh, kind of a mesh yeah, bag. Yeah, a mesh bag. Where the air can get through. And hang them up to let the surface moisture drain out. Bacon, and Dad, Dad had the best recipe for making sausage, and we still know how to do that. We, we just, he and I can still make sausage with Dad's recipe, and the uh, uh, they made they made li the liver wurst. You know, they use the large intestines for that, and the small intestines for the other sausage for the bratwurst. You've heard of the bratwurst days, and the uh, uh, I can remember Dad smoking them hot, yeah. smoking them just with. Out in a building, you know, build a fire, and then I smoked it. Actually, I actually smoked with smoke. Yeah, but I, I and the sausage. Sure the sausage. Yeah. But later on, they didn't do that anymore. No, it's, no. It's liquid smoke, then when that came out. And the, when deep freeze finally came along, and you freeze your sausages in there. Uh, another thing, when those old Germans butchered, there was the, the only thing that they didn't use was a squeal and the hoofs. And they all kind of, they even used the bristles because they had longer bristles. They used them for needles. When they made their horses, but these hogs didn't have as big a big wrist, but the, they even used the clean the stomach and made it uh, uh, out of the ears and parts of the head, you know, and then they'd fill it because it was cooked in oil, and they'd fill that and weight it down, and that was on, and they put stuff that stomach, you know, and that was just the best eating you ever ate. Did you make head cheese? Uh, some, yes. Mother's was a little different than the other people make it because it was, they had a little different knack, different spices to in the end of the German people. Yes, she made head cheese. And uh, about rendering your lard, we had a press, the same thing we stuffed the sausage with, you know. There was also a, a deal that you put in there to put these crackers in there, and then you run the, the lid down with the handle, and then that would squeeze more of that oil out, the grease out there. And uh, oftentimes, Mother, uh, I don't think Mother used them so much for making soap. You fed them to the chickens, and then you could. Well, they weren't much cornbread eaters because they didn't have cornmeal in the old country. But we did, we girls, as we got older, we made cornbread with crackers in them. But they just chopped them up and fed them to the chickens. Went on lunch. They loved lunch. them. Went chickens cold. cooked up one thing or another. They loved that. The old hands really liked those. And they made them too. And Mother made her soap, and I helped a lot of the time. It was uh, the, the waste lard that they, you know, that she saved up and lye. Now, she said it was lye soap. You had got cans of lye. That you put in there and took a lot of stirring uh, and it would take a, a in fact I have some soap up in some bags in the garage right now that was a little light soap yet yeah. every once in a while I go get a cake and put, wash my clothes in it it just makes it smell so clean I guess it's so white now that uh, on those cracklings uh, see that large cube small cube sort of so right so but the rind on it was just like this uh, pork rind you buy you should eat them like that, yes, them. they were good. And for their uh, for their liverwurst, they used the heart and the liver. They cooked it. It was all that and the meat off the head that was put into the large intestines. And then after it was, if the meat was first cooked, then there was it was stuffed, and then they put it back into that broth and boiled it again, so those casings would be cooked. <laughs> so it was completely all cooked, and then they were hung up to get, to drip. And to get, you know, and then they were hung in the cellar, and they would last several months. I mean, they'd keep, they wouldn't spoil because it, it was cool down there, and the meat all was cooked. But the, the enough lard in there that it would seep out. Seal. Seal it. Make it airtight. Yeah, couldn't get in. It's a good much. step. It's really good step. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I help. Help cook. I've, I've helped my share, me, me and the two young, rendering the lard, and it would take nearly all, we always butcher like two hogs at a time, and they, they would, that lard rending would take all day. Those big black kettles, which we still have, we still have the sausage stuffer and the grinder, we, you know, I have all those things. Uh, uh, also the... Uh, she got some other chores to do, so she put me about that kettle, and she said, now you stir that, keep oh, stirring it so that don't settle down, and... The whole, the whole family did the stirring. Huh? <laughs> 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 
there's yeah, what, 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 another thing I might mention here. Uh, Buffalo School closed in the 40s and it was consolidated and I was the last one to teach there. I taught the last two years it was in existence. And one of the ladies said that I was the only one that attended Buffalo School that was ever to teach out there. And so I made a little history. I taught, uh, like Sadie, I taught before I went to college. I took the teacher's examination when I was a senior, got my certificate, and then I went to school in the summer and taught the winter. And I taught over a period of 45 years, and of that, I taught 36. And I've been retired since 74. Now, when did you first teach? I taught at Victory District Number 1, West of Optimal. What, did you teach all eight grades? I didn't have all of the grades, but I taught from first to the eighth. Maybe I skipped maybe a fourth, any fourth grade or something like that. Then the next year, I taught at... Um, a limb up, Locust Grove, and I had, I think, practically all of the grades there. And then I... Uh, east of, east of no, Locust Grove is, is was just straight west of here. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe it's Locust Grove School. It was a rural school. I'm thinking of Locust Grove. No, no, uh -huh. okay. no it was it's five miles straight north of Optimal, and it makes about, about five or seven, six miles straight west of here. Uh, it, it, where the great big feed lot is now... It was a mile north of there. Uh, the uh, uh, then I went. Then I taught at Hooker in an optimal. I uh, taught at uh, Hooker and Optimal, and then came back and taught Buffalo. So I had four years, and at Buffalo I had all the grades. And you were wondering a while ago when you asked Sadie about how they got all of the grades in. You didn't. The older ones, I mean, not the men, but the older ones helped the younger ones. But I allotted 15 minutes for each class, and you taught. You just had class all day long to get all the subjects in. If you had a fifth grade, fifth grade had six or seven subjects, don't you see? Eighth grade, the same way. Can you just basically tell what your average day in the one room schoolhouse was like? Or what would you do during the day? Uh, well, I'll take Buffalo. That's the last one I taught at. I had four first graders, and like Sadie, I doted more of my time on those little fellows. The big ones could take care of themselves. And um, we always, it was during the Second World War, and those kids bought bonds and was, might put this in, and they bought enough to buy a Jeep. You know, there was a picture of a Jeep, and every time you bought some bonds, you pasted a picture on there. And when we got through, we had the whole Jeep bought. And for, I think there was something like nine children. Uh, well, I'd have an opening exercise, we always sang. Uh, then we had the little, I had the little folks read, and then I, I had all the reading classes after that, and put them to work on, in workbooks. And then went to the third grade. I didn't have a second grade that first year. And uh, they heard their reading, and so on, until I was all through through the eighth grade, and then I'd go back and have math all the way through. And then uh, probably, uh, whoa, when the little ones would do some coloring, maybe I'd have histories with some others, something like that. But you had to keep the little ones busy. And um, the, I had one eighth grader that, or seventh grader that year, and she could do her classes and her lessons. She was a very good student. And it, having been a two-room school, they had dwindled down to a one-room. And they had natural gas, which is free, the heat. So we kept warmth in the other room. The stove went all the time. And this one girl was always through with her work, so I'd send her to the other room, and she started some art. I gave her some art lessons. And today she's our photographer down the street. Uh, then all, then maybe, you know, in the afternoon we'd have geography, writing. Always after lunch we had a story, and then we had writing. The whole, all the class had writing. And there would be geography and history. And civics, you mention it. It was all day long. You had just one class after another. So uh, uh, it, uh, when you got home at night, you'd be hoarse. <laughs> uh, we had uh, programs. We had uh, Christmas programs at the rural school, and we had uh, uh, last day of school entertainment. You know, we had, and we'd have a last day of school dinner. Uh, so it was it just like we did in the early days. The old Buffalo, when we went to school there, we had literaries on Friday nights, you know, uh, maybe once a month. 
and from all over, and maybe one community would bring a play in one time, then we'd go over there, and it was an all evenings entertainment. They call it literary on Friday night. This school out here was uh, arranged in such a way that it had roll doors for the division line, and you roll those up, and you had the whole building then for literary. People could be seated, you know. And in the later years, then they had the gas, natural gas lights. Yeah. And just be, shortly before Christmas, then, where well, they'd have box supper. Oh, yes. They'd auction off these boxes, and With then they used that money for treats. treats for the kids, and Christmas trees, and decorations for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty. Real pretty. The boxes were decorated with tissue paper, you know, a crepe paper, you know, colored. Pretty. What year did you two graduate from high school? I graduated in 27, wasn't it? And I graduated in 28. We went our first two years at Optima, which was five miles from home, because uh, it was near home in Hooker, and it had um, a, only, it was only a two year school, a two year high school at that time when he was going. And then, um, when he had this two years, then he came to Hooker, and I rode a horseback up there because I didn't want to leave my friends. So I rode the 10 miles a day horseback. And the next year, Dad said, you're both going to the same school, and one of you is going to quit. So I came to Hooker, and we drove a Model T. In that one year, when we went to Optima, we had, we drove horse, two, two, two little horses, horses and a buggy. Kind of a pony-like horses, two of them, team, and a, and a buggy. And a buggy. And then, yeah. then the next year, I rode horseback. Five miles wonder yeah, way by back. Rain or shine. <coughs> in my last 22 years, I taught at Turpin, which put me into Beaver County. And then when it was really cold, I always hooked up at the south side of the building, that old garage that was there. That's where I hitched him up with the team. And uh, when it got down around 10, maybe or so, down pretty low, why, before you put the bit in the horse's mouth, you always blew your breath on it to kind of that coated it over. Freeze. If you put it in, you know, otherwise, it would freeze to their tongue or their mouth, you know. Hmm. Not and that many a time. Then, you know, we sit in that buggy with no top, no nothing in that kind of cold weather, and it would take, what, 45 minutes anyway to drive? Yeah, something That's like five that. miles? I think about that so many I times. could get there faster horseback because I galloped, you know. But with those two little ponies, even if they trotted, it'd it take 45 oh, yeah. minutes anyway. Were you a flapper in the 20s? Oh, yes. <laughs> Wore short skirts and those tight hats and short hair, long beads. Oh, yes. <laughs> I didn't do the Charleston, though, because I didn't go to dances. But, <laughs> but the Charleston was very much in evidence. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I was a flapper. I still have some of those dresses, too. You do? Yes. How did the uh, Depression affect you, too? Well, my dad didn't have any crop for 11 years out there on the farm, that I know. Uh, the, I think the cattle lived. He was able to buy hay, but they ate a lot of tumbleweeds. They did grow. And I remember Mother uh, wanted a new bedroom suite because she still had an original old bedroom furniture that they started housekeeping with, and she raised some turkeys, and she'd herd them every morning and let them eat grasshoppers. They, be eating, you know, living on these tumbleweeds. And this, when she sold those, she had enough money to buy a bedroom suite. But there, by having feed for the cows buying hay, they milked and sold the cream. And that was what you bought groceries with. Mm -hmm. eggs. Here comes your ruby. Maybe you're ready for her. Oh, help me. Right up. We had six head apiece. That'd be 12, and then we each had a, uh, one horse that we rode. So that'd be 14. Well, they my two brothers, and they had these horses on, and we had that reproduced not long ago, but he has a negative up there. Like, so I get some copies of those. I ran it, he, he found some, uh, some old pictures that they, they're back to what, 1912, where the, where the parts are flashing, wow. flashing Milo up by Optimal, and things of that nature. Yeah, that's kind of photographic. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, in World War II, was there still prejudice against the Germans around here? Not so much. Not so no, much. No, not so much. They were just glad to have those boys to fight for America. Yeah. yeah. Where did you go to college? At Goodwill and Gunnison. I was at Gunnison, Colorado. And I graduated from Goodwill. Mm -hmm. What year? I graduated in 1940. What was your impression when you heard the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor? Well, we were just a little bit gone. 
the we were a hunting. He and my husband and I uh, down on Pony Creek, and when we got back to the car, we turned on the radio, and that's when we heard it. And we, I guess, we all just looked at each other. You know, we just didn't know what to think about because we hadn't listened to the radio during the day. Uh, when you're through with your questions, I want to tell you a little, just one more little thing. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, last year, 1981, I was in maybe two years this summer at the Albuquerque to a convention. And uh, having been to the same kind of convention twice to H Hawaii, I have learned to know uh, a couple of Japanese, uh, a Japanese couple. And they have come over to our meetings for Delta Kappa Gamma meetings. And I've known them for many years. And when we went to Los Animas on a tour from Albuquerque, uh, we were given a tour of the, the plant where the bombs were made. And uh, out back they have duplicates or replicas of the bomb that fell on Hiroshima. And uh, believe it or not, we got them out the other evening, but George and I were looking at them. And I got those two Japanese people, he's ducking down, taking a picture of them. And if that isn't quite a prize picture, have the Japanese taking a picture of that bomb. It didn't dawn on me till the other night when I looked at it that I had a, a perfect prize picture and didn't know it. But they were taking a picture of the, the there were two sizes of those bombs. And the smaller one is the one that was dropped on Hiroshima. And there he is, he took pictures so many, and uh, there he is just uh, squatting down, taking a picture of those bombs, and she's just watching. Uh, I expect I've known those, well, I've known them since 1957. Yeah. What's your opinion of us dropping the bomb on Japan? I just never did, could quite see my way clear. The, the, how the, you know, knowing it did so much destruction, it's had me feel real sad. And yet, maybe that was the way to end things. Mm -hmm. Maybe the war would have gone on longer. It was, it was just a, a very terrible thing, you know, but I mean, for those yeah. people over there. But they seem not to hold up it as a grudge, because they're our friends now. Well, I think we have a good interview. Well, we hope we have more, Jim. <laughs> not at all. Thank you. I wanted to go ahead. I'd go out to the to the field, and they'd see me leave, and then they wouldn't see me till I'd maybe come in for noon. And you could barely see the sun shining, but you couldn't see maybe from here across the street. And if it hadn't have been on kind of the fence rows, I wouldn't even know where I was out there. You just get balled up in your directions. You didn't know whether you was going north or south. All that you knew that this was up and this was down. How'd you breathe in those dust storms? Well, you a lot of times didn't. we used to dust mashed, and on my tractor, I'd, I'd generally put a, a, a fairly heavy sack over the air breather to on keep the, it from... On the tractor. Up. And you just... Well, you just thought you had to do it, and you didn't think much about it. You just went ahead and done it. Uh, you were asking about the dust pneumonia a while ago. I think it reacted to the people similar to emphysema at the present time that we had. Right? You know what I mean? The people have emphysema. They have probably had it then too, but that's sort of the way the dust pneumonia reacted to the people. Uh, I know that it get the blackest black, and if and, you, and it was a kind of black that you lost a sense of direction. You did. You did not know which way you were going. Just and I know one time one was rolling in, and it was in technicolor. It was, it was in colors. The sun was shining, you know, and it was beautiful. It, they were beautiful but horrible the, the, when they rolled in. And I remember getting to, going to the bathroom and turning out all the lights, but I went in there so I could feel the walls, you see, and could turn the light back on. And it was honestly the blackest black that you ever encountered. I tell you what. Lose your sense of direction. It, it don't sound, sound believable. But when one of those really black ones hit, these lights like this wouldn't do you a bit of good in the house. It got dark in the house. And then dust sifting just in. That dust would get in. It just, and it, it'd come through a pinhole. You know, the, um, the north, we had two north windows on the farm out at home that were on the, in the front room. And after one of those dust storms, we'd get one of those big, you know, big dish pan. From each window, you get a dish pan full. Of dust. Yeah. Dust. And that stuff, was was just like grease. Uh huh. It came from all oh, from somewhere else, you know. You, you couldn't brush it up. Nah, sweep it's it. It's smear. It was just like grease, greasy. A lot of people had to put their food and if they want to clean dishes, you better put them in the oven and just and close the oven. Uh, they, they they wouldn't stay clean in the cabinet, in the cupboards. It seeped in everywhere. A lot of people put wet sheets over their children's beds so they wouldn't smother. 
uh, and take him to the breeze. One other thing I would like to mention here. I had, especially after night, when, when we had one of those dust storms, I seen barbed wire fences glow. Static electricity. Now, that don't seem possible. That's but true. But I know some other people I've seen. And the windmill wheel, it would glow. Static You'd go up there and touch that wire that came where you shut it off, it'd knock you loose. Shock you. It'd double you up. Yeah, there's a wire yeah. came down to a handle that you stopped your windmill with. Yeah, it'd be all oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Now, of I've course, we had a wooden, wooden handle on her, so I didn't, you didn't have to touch it. But, but actually, after dark, I had seen those wheels glow, and I've seen the barbed wire well, fence. Well, can you imagine what that did to, veg to the vegetation? See, there wouldn't be any. Well, and we didn't have rain either. We used to get a insulated wire, my brother and I, Jake and I, we hook it onto this. Well, we'd tie a spark plug on this end first, and then we'd come around, hook it onto, and she just sparked across. Right, spark plug, just like it was, like it done in the car. That doesn't sound believable, but actually, I seen it. So, wouldn't you say that we were t pioneers a second time mm -hmm. around? <laughs> Did you want him to sign too? I don't have to sign that one. Well, I think it'd be nice. If he put his name on there. Don't need it. Don't need it at all, huh? Okay, thank you. You bet.